Hi, good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. Um, I'm Dana Bowen, one of the UH Chiefs. Uh, welcome to uh, the Department of Medicine's uh, Grand Rounds. Um, this morning, before we get started, just a few housekeeping things. Please make sure your mics are off and your videos are off until it's time for questions if we have time at the end. Um, and lastly, CME information for today will be in the slides and I'll also periodically put it in the chat box. Today, our speaker is Dr. Kave Haji Fathalian, one of our Rutgers NDMS faculty, joining us for a presentation on uh, endoscopies in 2022. Dr. Haji Fathalian is Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at Rutgers NDMS and the Director of the Advanced Endoscopy at Rutgers University Hospital. He completed his medical degree at Tehran University of Medical Sciences and went on to complete his internal medicine residency at Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, followed by his fellowships in gastroenterology and hepatology, and then therapeutic endoscopy at Cornell University, New York Presbyterian Hospital. He also earned an MPH from Harvard University. Dr. Haji Pathalian research focuses on the role of minimally invasive endoscopic procedures in the management of obesity and chronic liver and biliary disease, as well as development and evaluation of cutting-edge advanced endoscopic uh, techniques. He has published more than 60 papers in prestigious scientific journals, and his work has been cited more than 14,000 times by other researchers in the field. Dr. Harvey Bethalian is associate editor for Forget, the official journal of the American Forget Society, and is a member of various medical associations, such as the American Society for Gastroenterology gastrointestinal endoscopy. We welcome you and thank you, Dr. Haji Fathalian, for joining us today to give this presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the thank you for the nice introduction and also thank you for the opportunity to be with you. Uh, I guess it's for the first ground rounds for 2022. Um, I'm gonna just head in and start today. Uh, I'm gonna basically give a very quick overview of you know the different fields uh, in advanced and therapeutic endoscopy uh, that are available in, and are also available at Rutgers uh, University Hospital. Uh, we are going to talk about endobariatrics, which is going to be the application of endoscopic procedures for management of obesity. We are going to talk about endohepatology, which is going to be the application of diagnostic and therapeutic endoscopic procedures uh, in patients with chronic liver disease and cirrhosis. We are going to talk about biliary treatment a little bit uh, beyond your traditional EUTP that everybody is familiar with. We are going to talk about therapeutic EUS uh, and EUS guided drainage and anastomosis. We are going to talk a little bit about endoscopic resections for premalignant and uh, for premalignant and malignant uh, lesions. We are going to talk about uh, third space endoscopy and endoscopic myotomies and some other endoscopic procedures that we can do. Obviously, we are not going to go really in depth in any of these areas. Uh, this is uh, really uh, meant to function as, a, as an introduction into advanced and therapeutic endoscopy. So let's uh, start with endobariatrics. The, the devices that you can see here in this slide, they are endoscopic suture and a stapling devices. And it is really because of these devices that we have been able to go beyond uh, just placing balloons in people's stomach in the field of endobariatrics. On the left side, you see the Apollo overstitch device. On the right side, you see the US endoscopy tissue stapling device. And these are the devices that let us do full thickness suturing and tissue approximation during an endoscopy. The first endobariatic procedure that I want to introduce to you is endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, or ESG. Um, this is going to be a short uh, animation and movie clip. As you can see in this animation, the basic idea is that you're going to place sutures between the anterior and posterior walls of the stomach. Uh, and when you approximate those sutures, you're going to have a decrease in the gastric volume. Uh, this restriction of gastric volume in the body of the stomach is the most important part uh, in achieving weight loss in these patients. Uh, this, this, is, this procedure is meant to replicate a sleep gastrectomy, a surgical sleep gastrectomy 
but without cutting any part of the stomach. You can see here the procedure being done in a real patient, obviously. Uh, that is a tissue helix that we use to make sure that we are placing completely full thickness sutures. As you just saw, the suture goes through and through the wall of the stomach so that it is durable. And after all the sutures are placed, when we cinch them and tighten them, as you see here, the stomach is going to change into a long tubular uh, structure with, uh, you know, significantly diminished volume leading to weight loss. In the beginning, uh, the studies on ESG were mostly one or two year uh, follow up, but last year we were able to publish the longest follow up on this procedure for five years after the procedure and show that patients maintain an average total body weight loss about 16% of their total body weight for five years at, uh, after the procedure, showing it's at least midterm durability, which is very significant for a procedure that usually has a recovery time of a few hours to a couple of days, uh, is done as outpatient, and patients usually tolerate it very well. It is also reversible. We can cut the sutures back open, or you can, if you do not have enough uh, weight loss, you can go ahead and do any bariatric surgery afterwards so it doesn't burn any bridges. Um, I told you that restriction of gastric volume is the most important factor in weight loss, but there are other parts of physiology that are uh, that are involved, including motility. This is a nice study comparing patients after ESG or endoscopic stiff gastroplasty with controls. Controls are the blue line, the ESG patients are the red line. The vertical axis is gastric retention and the X axis is time. And as you can see, after ESG, there is you know, increased gastric retention and decreased rate of gastric emptying leading to increased satiety and weight loss. So it is not just mechanical uh, restriction, some uh, motility of the stomach changes as well. And even beyond that, uh, there are some favorable hormonal changes as well. This is another study that we published last year. As you can see, within one week, the x-axis is time in week, and the y-axis is insulin resistance as measured by HOMA IR. You see that within one week, there is a, there is a significant improvement in insulin resistance before there is any significant change in uh, weight. And that is maintained for up to 96 weeks in this study. Uh, some of it might be because of the post-procedural diet, but we also think that there are many favorable hormonal changes that happen because of the change in the geometry and motility of the stomach after this procedure. Uh, in a separate study, we have also been able to show very favorable results in patients with fatty liver after ESG. Um, as you know, fatty liver is very common and, you know, very, very common in patients with obesity. Here, we, we were able to show favorable outcomes regarding improvement of predicted fibrosis in patients with fatty liver um, one year after their ESG. Um, so really, the data for endoscopic sleep gastroplasty is um, proving to be very strong. It is durable. It's a safe procedure. It has many good outcomes, uh, both for weight loss and also associated comorbidities. Uh, a large multicenter clinical trial on this uh, procedure is going to be published this year, and we are hopeful that after that, we are going to have a better luck with uh, insurance coverage for this procedure, which is right now very, very hard to get insurance coverage for most of the centers that uh, offer this procedure, uh, offer it in the form of cash pay. Um, we are offering this procedure to our patients as well. We have just started offering it, and we are trying to find a way to get insurance coverage for it. Uh, the next procedure that I'm going to talk to you about is transoral outlet reduction, or TOR. This procedure is mainly performed uh, to treat weight regain in patients who have already had a Ruan Y gastric bypass. As you can see in the picture, when someone has a Ruan Y gastric bypass, most of their stomach is excluded, as you can see on the left side. They have a small pouch, and the pouch is connected to their jejunum uh, using a stoma or a gastrojejunostomy and a stomosis. Um, weight regain is a big problem in patients after Ruan Y gastric bypass. This is a nice meta-analysis in JAMA. You can see in the first row that 
after five years, more than 60% of these patients have a weight regain of more than 10 kilogram or uh, approximately more than 20 pounds, which is very significant. Um, weight regain in all patients with obesity is multifactorial. Compliance is very important. Management of patients' psychological comorbidities is very important. But the anatomical aspects of the surgery are also very important. And after Ruan Y gastric bypass, really a stoma side, the size of that opening from the stomach into the jejunum is really important. As you can see in this graph, there is a linear association between the size of that stoma and weight regain. Um, and as the stoma gets bigger and gets dilated, it is easier for patients to eat. They do not feel the restriction anymore, and they are going to have weight regain. To treat this problem, patients can have open or laparoscopic surgical revision or redo of their anastomosis or, uh, or adjustable bands can be placed around the pouch. The problem is that the patient has already, usually the patients uh, have shown that they are not very compliant. Uh, they have already had weight regain and technically speaking, the rate of adverse events are higher, significantly higher in revisional surgery compared to their original bariatric surgery. So surgeons are not very enthusiastic um, about doing revisional surgery in these patients. Um, and as you can imagine, you know, being very common, you have a lot of patients around who have had Ruan Y gastric bypass a few years ago, and now they have significant weight regain. Uh, it is specifically very prevalent around the Rutgers University Hospital as well. Uh, so there is the TOR procedures and endoscopy procedure to take care of that. In this video clip, you see that first we perform tissue destruction around that stoma or opening that you see here. It's very large. Um, after tissue destruction using argon plasma coagulation, we are going to use the you know suturing device to place sutures around that large stoma. Just just uh, pay attention to how large the stoma is, and then at the end you will see how small it will become. Uh, the best type of suture to place is, you know, a complete circular suture that is called the Purse String Pattern. You place the sutures all around the stoma, and at the end, uh, you can tighten the sutures, cinch them. Uh, you can use a balloon at the same time to size the stoma and make it as small as you want. Usually, we try to make it smaller than about eight millimeters. And at the end of the procedure, as you will see just in a second, that very large stoma turns into a very small stoma, just like they had after their surgery. This is a very successful procedure. This also has um, now midterm uh, follow-up outcomes for five years. And as you can see, the uh, bar on the right is the five-year result. And you can see that these patients maintain a total body weight loss of eight to nine percent. This is an extra total body weight loss of nine to eight to nine percent five years after doing this procedure. Again, this procedure is done outpatient as well, and patients tolerate it very well. Um, the last bariatric procedure that I'm going to talk to you about is the one that you are most familiar with, uh, is intragastric balloon placement. These are the pictures of different types of balloons that have been introduced into United States market. But right now, really just one of them is widely av available or Vera balloon. Uh, another balloon has been recently approved over the past two months, um, and uh, we are going to start using it as well, but it, it is not commonly used yet. Intragastric balloons work in short term. This is the results of a, you know, one of the main trials. You can see that you know, patients who have had balloon, the red line, and patients who have uh, been controlled uh, with uh, lifestyle modification, exercise, and diet are the blue line. And you can see after six months, there's a significant difference than patients who have received an intragastric balloon. They have a weight loss of about 10 to 11 percent. Unfortunately, at six months, you need to remove the balloon. The balloon is not indicated to stay in the stomach for more than six months. And then afterwards, patients start to experience a significant weight regain. Uh, as you see in this meta-analysis, the first red diamond from the top, it's six months results. You see a total body weight loss of around 12 to 13 percent. Then if you come down at 12 months, you see that that decreases to about 10 to 11 percent. And when you get to 36 months, 
uh, it becomes around 5%. And there are studies that follow these patients for longer, for about four to five years. Uh, one is study up to six years, and patients usually maintain a total body weight loss that is less than 5%, which is less than what you would need for improvement in any of the important obesity-related comorbidities. So, intragastric balloons are really a very short-term solution. Uh, however, obesity is a chronic, long, uh, you know, lifelong disease. Uh, we usually try to use it just for losing weight, maybe before a surgery. For example, a patient needs to have a hernia surgery. They need to lose weight quickly. We can place an intragastric balloon. But really, it's not considered, a, you know, a durable solution for uh, patients with obesity. There are other endobariatric procedures. Um, there is Botox injection to cause gastroparesis, satiety, and weight loss. The data shows that that probably doesn't really work. There are endobarrier devices under study. These are just physical barrier devices. Um, you can imagine like a you know plastic sleeve that you place in duodenum to prevent absorption in the duodenum. They usually help a lot with diabetes, but their weight uh, effects are less prominent. And as you can imagine, they can migrate, they can you know, cause pancreatitis, they can cause cholangitis. Uh, they are still under study and not ready for clinical use. There are duodenal mucosal resurfacing procedures. They are also under study and not ready for clinical use. Uh, in these procedures, you use hot water or radio frequency to ablate the mucosa in the duodenum, again, to prevent absorption of mostly simple sugars in the proximal small bowel. Um, the studies that are available right now, they show that they have significant effects on the control of diabetes. You can expect a decrease in A1C by 1 to 1 1.5%, but they really do not have any effects on the on patient's weight. And uh, finally, there is aspire assist or aspiration therapy Basically, it's a glorified PEC tube. You place a PEC tube uh, with some locking mechanism into someone's stomach, and after they eat their food, they need to aspirate their food out. Uh, they usually take about you know 30 to 40 percent of the, their caloric intake out. It has good results. It shows a total body weight loss of 12 percent at one year, and you can you know continue to use it indefinitely. But the patient population who would like to have a PEC to aspirate their food after they eat it, it's a very special patient population. So this is not a procedure that is done very commonly. So we are going to change gear now, and we are going to talk about endohepatology a little bit, uh, which, as I said, is you know the cross section of advanced endoscopy and basically cirrhosis and chronic liver disease. Uh, we are going to talk about US guided liver biopsy. We are going to talk about US guided portal systemic gradient pressure. Uh, talk a little bit about US guided lastography and US guided embolization for treatment of gastric varices. Uh, so, for liver biopsy, you are all familiar with the usual way of doing liver biopsies percutaneous liver biopsy or transjugular liver biopsy done either by hepatologists, gastroenterologists, or by interventional radiology. Compared to that, an US guided liver biopsy, which is an endoscopic procedure, done most of, most of the time from the stomach with an endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, you have the availability of taking biopsies from both right and left lobe and also target your biopsies. So instead of doing almost blind biopsies percutaneously, uh, you, you can uh, sample different areas of the liver at the same time. It is important for some liver disease because their involvement is patchy and you need to have uh, more samples to get a correct diagnosis, but also in clinical use, they are very important. For example, last week we had a patient who had uh, HCC, but the imaging findings were not typical, so we needed a biopsy of that. And the surgeon was thinking about doing a resection, palliative resection, because uh, because of pain, and they wanted to know if the remaining uh, liver is healthy enough to do a resection. We did an EUS guided liver biopsy. We were able to biopsy the main tumor. We were able to separately biopsy the remaining liver to show whether that had cirrhosis or not. And we were also able to find tumors in the left lobe of the liver that did not show up on cross-sectional imaging and biopsy those separately as well to give a complete picture of patient's clinical status to the surgeon. Uh, it is also done under complete visualization of the needle path. So that helps to minimize the adverse events from the procedure you are able to avoid uh, puncturing vessels. 
function in biliary blocks. It can also be combined with other endoscopic procedures that are commonly needed in these patients. You can do portal pressure measurement at the same time, banding or embolization of varices, perform ERCP, and it is not uncommon that these patients have, need all of these procedures. Previously, we used to take send them to IR, for example, for a liver biopsy and then come back for an endoscopy, but now we can do everything at the same time. Um, if you remember, um, after your percutaneous liver biopsies, your patient needs to stay in hospital for four hours, two hours on their side, two hours on their back. But when we do EUS liver biopsy, you don't need to have, you know, you, need to, you don't need to bother with that. You're doing it under direct visualization and you know if there's a hematoma or bleeding. And it also, it is associated with significantly decreased patient anxiety and discomfort. So I'm gonna show to you how it is done very um, briefly. This is gonna be an EUS image which means that it is an ultrasound probe at the tip of an endoscope. Uh, the endoscope right now is in someone's stomach. Um, you can see the vasculature. As you can see here, you can see your needle trajectory completely. Uh, we used Doppler and made sure that there are no vessels. And now you see the needle introduced into the liver. It is a 19 gauge needle. And uh, you take your sample using this core biopsy needle. It's not a, a aspiration needle, it's a core biopsy needle. Usually we pass the uh, capsule of the liver twice, and then we do two or three actuations per pass to get a good sample. This has been studied very well. Uh, this is study, as you see the results in the table, the number of complete portal triads are comparable between the IR biopsies and EUS guided biopsies. And the length of the sample is even larger in EUS guided biopsy compared to IR biopsy. This is another study uh, done with even a better technique. And you see that the number of complete portal triads, which is the last row in the table, they had a median of 18 complete portal triads in this study, which is you know much better than the 11 that you need for an excellent liver biopsy. We have been doing this as well over the past four months since I've joined, and I have talked with our pathologists multiple times, and they are completely satisfied with the with the quality of the biopsies that we are sending to them. About the EUS guided portosystemic pressure measurement, again, this is something that you're used to uh, being done by interventional radiology, uh, which which is performed indirectly when it is done by uh, interventional radiology. They have access to the hepatic vein but they do not have uh, direct access to the portal vein. But if you perform it in EUS guided manner, you can you have uh, direct access to both the hepatic venous system and the portal venous system. As you can see in the top row on the right, uh, if your uh, endoscope, echo endoscope is in the stomach, you can access the hepatic veins, uh, you can access the intrahepatic IVC or usually the left or middle hepatic vein directly and place a needle in there, as you can see in the top row on the left. And on the bottom row, you can see that from the same position in the stomach, you have access to the left portal vein. And if you want, you can go into the duodenum and you will have access to the main portal vein as well. So basically you place the uh, 25 gauge needle into these vessels and you measure the pressure directly. And with a simple calculation, you have the portal, uh, portal systemic gradient uh, measurement. Uh, this is a video clip showing how it is done. Uh, again, uh, we are looking uh, at someone's liver. This is the right lobe of liver. We change the position into the stomach. On the right side of the screen, you can see the heart beating. Um, and then in the middle of the screen in the liver, you can see an anechoic tubular structure, which is the left hepatic vein, uh, which we are gonna just point out right now. And if you continue looking, you are going to be able to find the rest of the vascular structure of the liver as well. You can easily usually find the umbilical part of the left portal vein, as pointed out here. And you can also find the IVC and the middle hepatic vein. In the middle hepatic vein is the anechoic structure that you see right now. So basically, after you are able to uh, find all of your vascular structures. You can then use power Doppler to check their Doppler signature to make sure that the hepatic veins show their own signature, which is triphasic 
the portal vein shows its own signature, and here you see a needle that is uh, placed directly into the middle hepatic vein, and using that pressure measurement device, you measure the pressure directly, then you repeat the same procedure by placing the needle into the portal vein, and then you will have the portal systemic gradient. Uh, we have been performing this procedure as well. There are just two hospitals right now in New Jersey performing this procedure. It is us and um, Roy Wood Johnson. Um, our, our hepatologists and surgeons are very interested in this procedure. Uh, before doing surgery for patients, they want to know, um, you know, they want to prognosticate them uh, using their portal systemic gradient, and hepatologists are also interested to know this as the main pathophysiology driving the uh, morbidity and mortality in patients with chronic liver disease. Uh, the correlation between this and the transjugular uh, pressure measurement has been performed uh, in animal studies. And as you can see here, it shows uh, almost perfect correlation. Very large studies are undergoing right now. Um, a few studies in uh, humans have been published as well. And we were able to recently publish a study ourselves showing a good correlation between EUS guided portal systemic gradient measurement and uh, meaningful clinical outcomes such as patients' predicted fibrosis or presence of uh, clinical signs of portal hypertension. And we are using it clinically routine, uh, routinely at uh, Rutgers University Hospital right now. Uh, finally, we are going to talk about EUS embolization of gastric varices. Um, as you know, there are different types of gastric viruses. On the top left, you see, you know, the type 1 or GOV1 viruses. On the right side, you see cardiofundal or GOV2 and IGV1 viruses. Uh, it gets very complicated very fast. Uh, these viruses have different input and out, uh, inflow and outflow of venous blood. I'm just going to tell you that the, you know, guidelines and algorithms for treatment of gastric viruses have been changing a lot. And uh, in the last version of the guidelines published and update, there is a very large em emphasis on endoscopic management of these viruses. This is the this is the algorithm in the guideline. I'm just going to point out where it is mentioned to perform endoscopic management for these gastric viruses. As you can see, for most of the situations, you can perform gastric, uh, you can perform endoscopic management. And endoscopic embolization is done under the guide of uh, and, uh, ultrasound. And we use the you know same coil vascular coils and glue that uh, usually our uh, radiology colleagues or neurosurgery or neurology colleagues are using. Uh, we are going to change gear again. Uh, talk about biliary treatment in patients with alter anatomy. Obviously, in patients with normal anatomy, uh, if there is access to the ampulla, we always prefer to do a traditional ERCP. But there are many situations where you cannot do a traditional ERCP. You know, patients can have a BROC2 surgery, they can have a Whipple surgery, they can have a Ruan Y gastric bypass, they can even have a duodenal switch. And in all of these situations, it might be hard to get to the ampulla or the or the biliary system. The traditional way of taking care of this is either doing an enteroscopy assisted ERCP, uh, which you see on the left, using a very long scope, trying to go through, you know, uh, jump through all the hoops go through all the connections, get to the ampulla or to the uh, biliary anastomosis and do work. This usually doesn't work very well. Or as you see on the right side, just go directly from the skin and do a PTC with radiology. Um, but beyond that, now we have EUS guided approaches. Uh, we can do rendezvous technique, which as you can see in these images, basically means that using that echo endoscope, we can gain access into the biliary system with a needle, just the way you saw us putting a needle into the vessels. We can put them in the biliary ducts as well, pass a guide wire, and then use that guide wire to gain access into the biliary system. Or we can also do direct transluminal techniques, uh, which are even more advanced. Uh, in, this, in this case, you don't even need to get to the biliary anastomosis or to the ampulla. You can directly open a connection between the hepatic ducts, both intra and then extra hepatic ducts, into the stomach or into the lumen of duodenum and drain the biliary system directly into the lumen of the GI tract. Uh, this is very useful if there is tumor involvement of the area of the ampulla or patients have had complicated surgeries in the past. Um, these approaches have been compared together. Um, as you can see here, uh, the right column is the traditional approach with endos enteroscopy assisted ERCP. The left column is the neuro 
approach of EUS guided, you can see that the technical success rate is very different, 98% yeah, compared to 65%, but even more importantly, the clinical success, which is usually the resolution of jaundice, is also significantly different, 88% compared to 59%. And the adverse event, although all adverse events are uh, different from each other, when you look at the severe adverse events and mortality, there is no difference between the two approaches. So really an EUS guided approach, if it's done correctly, is going to be both effective and safe. Um, I'm going to uh, focus on one of these EUS guided approaches because it gives you a very good idea of how we do EUS guided therapeutics. It's called the EDGE procedure. Uh, and we use it to do ERCP in patients who have had one y gastric bypass. As, as you see in the pictures depicting the anatomy after one y gastric bypass, your stomach is excluded from the pouch. So when you go down from the esophagus, you don't get to the stomach, you just get to the pouch. But your ampulla is connected to that excluded stomach. So using an EUS endoscope, we can open a connection between the pouch and the excluded stomach and then go through that connection so that we can get to the ampulla and do ERCP. Again, this has been compared to the traditional approach of entroscopy assisted ERCP. You see that technical success is much better, 100% to 60%, and the adverse event rates are very comparable. So in this video, uh, you can see how the uh, EDGE procedure is performed, and you will see how we use a uh, lumen opposing metal stent. It is, a, it is a metal stent that we love using because it lets us make connections between different organs uh, endoscopically, and it is, uh, you know, it is very useful when you're doing uh, EUS guided procedures. Uh, you might heard the name of the stent is called in the United States, we have the Axios stent. Um, here again, under ultrasound uh, guidance, uh, you will see the excluded stomach, which is decompressed right now, a needle is placed into it, and then we uh, expand it by injection of uh, saline and contrast. And now we place a catheter into that target organ. That catheter contains the lumen opposing stent. And in a moment, you are gonna see that we are gonna open the distal flange of that stent. That stent looks like a dumbbell. And we are gonna open the distal flange. You just saw it open. And then after we open that, we are gonna open the proximal flange, which looks like this. And now you have a window between two separate organs, in this case, between your pouch and the excluded stomach. And then we can go through that window. Uh, here you see the fluoroscopy, get to the ampulla, and do our uh, ERCP uh, just like normal. Uh, the same technique can be used to perform EUS guided anastomosis. For example, here you see a picture of gastric outlet obstruction, which is a common problem. Uh, these days usually happen because of malignancies, head of pancreas malignancies, or periampillary malignancies. And patients have, you know, incessant nausea and vomiting. Uh, they feel very poorly. Um, usually, the the treatment in the past has been to place luminal stents that you are familiar with. Uh, the problem with that is. Uh, that, you know, after two, three, four months, uh, usually the stents uh, have uh, tumor ingrowth or overgrowth and they stop working. And these patients right now, they have much better survival compared to before using combination chemotherapy. So we need to have a more lasting solution. Uh, patients can go uh, uh, under surgical anastomosis, gastrojejunostomy, uh, which is effective, but, you know, it comes with the mortality and morbidity associated with surgery, especially in patients with end-stage cancer. So what you can do is that you can use the same stent that I showed you before uh, and make a connection directly between the stomach and patient's proximal jejunum, as you can see in these pictures. The stent, you can see the stent on the, on the picture on the right. You see that it looks like a dumbbell with two flanges. We place one of the flanges into the jejunum, the other flange into the stomach and then we oppose the walls of the different organs and make a connection between them. This has been studied and compared to the laparoscopic uh, gastrojejunostomy. As you can see, uh, the clinical success rate is not uh, different between the two, but as you can expect, the adverse event rate and the cost of the procedure is much lower um, and much, much more cost-effective 
when you are doing an EUS guided gastrojejun ostomy. The same uh, idea of going beyond the walls of the lumen uh, can be uh, used for management of many different uh, diseases. Here you see pictures showing you know, treatment of necrotizing pancreatitis. Uh, in these patients, we can use the same type of stents or other types of stent to open a connection between the posterior wall of the stomach, as you can see in the picture, and the wall of pancreatic necrosis or the pseudocyst that these patients have and perform endoscopic necrostectomy, meaning that we go through the connection with the endoscope, we go into the retroperitoneum, and we take care of the infected necrosome. Um, this has been, again, studied very uh, extensively over the past several years. And right now, universally in tertiary care centers, uh, endoscopic drainage of uh, pseudocysts and wall of pancreatic necrosis and endoscopic necrostectomy is the preferred method. Uh, and nobody really goes to surgery first, usually with a combination of endoscopic management and percutaneous drainage if needed. Uh, almost all patients are going to have a very good outcome uh, compared to going to surgery. Uh, the last type of EUS drainage that I'm going to talk to you about is going to be the EUS drainage of gallbladder uh, for patients with uh, obstruction, maybe because of malignancy or cholecystitis because of stones. And these are patients who, do, who are not good surgical candidates at the moment or ever. Um, uh, you are familiar with placing a percutaneous cholecystostomy tube for drainage of the gallbladder, but now we can use the same idea that you saw to drain the gallbladder, usually into the duodenum or the antrum of the stomach as well. Uh, this has been studied and compared to the percutaneous uh, uh, approach as well. As you see in the, in the top row, the technical success is comparable. The clinical success is also comparable. But when you look at the adverse events and unplanned admissions, you see that you might know this by, uh, by experience as well, that patients who have percutaneous cholecystostomy tubes, they come back to hospital very frequently uh, because of dislodgement, because it's, uh, it's clogged, because they have leakage. Uh, you see that unplanned admissions are up to 71% in patients with percutaneous cholecystostomy tubes. But when you do uh, EUS guided uh, drainage, they have just uh, 7%, so one tenth of that. And uh, adverse events are also much lower, 24% compared to 75%. So this is also in the in the uh, right uh, patient. This is also a very useful uh, type of drainage. Usually for palliation, we do not like patients to have external drains because it affects their quality of life significantly, and they need to come back to hospital. We prefer to do these EUS guided approaches for palliation in patients with cancer. Uh, so that they can have a good quality of life at home. So now we are going to change gear again. Uh, we are going to talk very briefly about endoscopic resection of malignant and pre-malignant uh, lesions. You are familiar with the usual endoscopic resection, which is just using a snare for polypectomy during endosc uh, during colonoscopy. But the field of endoscopic resection has uh, gone beyond that, really, as you will see. Uh, here, uh, you will see pictures of a procedure called ESD or endoscopic submucosal dissection. Uh, the, the, the concept in this procedure is that you have a submucosal layer uh, everywhere in the uh, GI lumen, which is a potential space, and you can inject it with an injectate, usually with saline and methylene blue, as you can see in the top row, uh, and then change this potential space into an actual space. And then you can uh, put your endoscope into that space, not in the lumen of the GI anymore, into that submucosal space and do, you know, dissection underneath a lesion uh, under direct visualization and get a complete un unblocked resection of your malignant or pre-malignant lesion. Um, just like a surgical resection, uh, your pathologist can tell you whether you have a complete histological resection, whether you have lymphovascular invasion, they can stage the lesion, and it can be curative if the patient is selected correctly. Uh, this, is a, this is an example of the same procedure performed in the, in the stomach. In the top row, you see that uh, the lesion is marked. Uh, in the bottom on the left, you, you just see blue uh, because we are not in the lumen of the stomach anymore. We are in the submucosal space. 
uh, which we have dyed blue with injecting methane blue and saline. And the bottom row on the right, you see that you know the lesion is completely resected, uh, pinned down, and uh, sent to pathology. Uh, the same idea is used in a different way, which is called a stair. Uh, you do the same thing, go into the that potential space in the submucosa. These procedures as a group are called third space endoscopy because they are not done inside of the lumen. They are also not done outside of the lumen like the EOS procedures that I showed you, but they are done in the third space, which is the potential space in the submucosa. Here, uh, you can use a tunnel to get to your uh, a tunnel in the submucosa to get to your lesion and then do resection. And then even beyond that, we can do endoscopic full thickness resection. Uh, you can do it freehand or using a device that is available to us at Rutgers as well. Um, and in this procedure, you just do a complete full thickness resection of that area. So you're taking all the layers of the wall out, uh, including serosa. As an example, we recently we had a patient with colon cancer. A patient had uh, cirrhosis with portal hypertension and uh, uh, was not a good surgical candidate. And you know, instead of going to surgery for that for that cancer, we perform an endoscopic full thickness resection uh, to resect the area of the cancer, and it was a complete resection as well. So these studies, these uh, all of these techniques for endoscopic resection, they have been studied, you know, extensively. I'm not going to go into the details. I'm just showing you some uh, tables on these studies. Uh, the whole point is that uh, please trust me. This is there is a lot of data. And if your patient is selected correctly and the procedure is done well, these, uh, these procedures are very efficacious. They can lead to cure easily and they're extremely safe. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about endoscopic myotomies a little bit. Um, I'm going to motivate this by talking about achalasia. Uh, you see a picture of a barium esophagram in a patient with achalasia. You're all familiar with that picture a dilated esophagus with a bird beak uh, at the end. Uh, on the top, you see the high resolution manometry of patients with achalasia. They do not have any opening of their uh, lower esophageal sphincter at the gastro uh, uh, esophageal junction. On the top left, you see type one. These are patients that have no opening in their uh, GEJ, but also they do not have any peristalsis. Type two and three on the right, they have some form of remaining disordered peristalsis as well, but the main pathophysiology is that your G junction just doesn't open. So to treat that previously, uh, the options were to do nomadic dilation um, to dilate the G junction. Uh, that is really a temporary measure. You need to repeat it uh, or to do heller myotomy to cut the muscles at the G junction during a surgery. But now we have the point procedure. You're all familiar with it, although we were not doing it at uh, Rutgers University Hospital before. Um, it's the same idea of the third space endoscopy. On the uh, pic picture on the left, you see that we have created a tunnel underneath the mucosa and we have placed the endoscope into that tunnel. The endoscope is not in the lumen anymore. And then the tunnel is extended down into the GE junction. And then the middle picture, you see that uh, while in the tunnel, we can perform a complete full thickness myotomy, meaning that we are going to cut the muscles, both the circular and longitudinal muscles at the GE junction, just like a Heller myotomy. And at the end, you're just going to come out of the tunnel and close the tunnel and the patient can go home the same day and they can start drinking clear liquids the same day and then starting to have full liquids in a couple of days. Uh, this procedure uh, works very well. Uh, this is, these are uh, meta-analysis comparing the effectiveness of point procedure compared to the surgical approach, Heller myotomy. Um, as you see for type one, Heller myotomy, 81% effective. Poem is 95% effective. For type two surgery is 92% effective. Poem is 97% effective. Uh, and for type three surgery is not very effective, it's 71 compared to POEM, which is 93%. So in all types of achalasia, POEM is very effective. Uh, for type three, uh, really, it's you know not really appropriate to do surgery for them. It's better to do POEM. Uh, usually for patients that are very young, we prefer to send them to surgery if they have type one or type two. Uh, for patients that are middle age or a little bit older, uh, we prefer to do POEM for them for treatment of achalasia. 
patient, uh, um, you know, choice is also important. Obviously, POEM is a much less invasive. It's a minimally invasive procedure compared to a, a laparoscopic killer myelin. The same idea can be used for treatment of uh, gastroparesis, which is a very common problem in the United States. Again, as you see, uh, top left, we inject the submucosal space with that blue injectate. Top right, we uh, introduce the endoscope into the submucosal. Middle left, we extend the tunnel to get to the pylorus. And then middle on the right, you start cutting the pylorus muscles. And then on the bottom, you just close the tunnel and come out. Again, a minimally invasive approach to do the same thing that was previously done by surgery. Uh, this is another meta-analysis comparing GPOM for management of gastroparesis to uh, pylor surgical pyloroplasty. As you can see on the right side, the rate, uh, the red diamond, uh, the effectiveness is the same as measured by patient symptoms, and then the effectiveness again is the same as measured by gastric emptying time. Uh, this can be used for, you know, management of course, surgical gastroparesis, which is a big problem as well. So, you are going to ask me, uh, well, was it all is, is this all you can do in advanced and therapeutic endoscopy in 2022? And the answer is obviously no, of course not. There is a lot more that we can do, but it's going to take, uh, you know, another hour or two to talk about all those different procedures, at least to mention them. Uh, we can do TIF procedure for management of GERD. Uh, which is an endoscopic fund application instead of doing your Nissen or you know door or two pay fund fund application. Uh, if there is any perforation, we can you know do primary closure anywhere in the in the body. In the esophagus, it's very useful. Patients instead of getting an esophagectomy for uh, uh, esophageal perforation, uh, they can get an, an endoscopic minimally invasive procedure, and they do much better. If there is any abscess anywhere in the body, we can drain it. You know, two weeks ago we had a patient that had uh, left subphrenic abscess after after an abdominal surgery that has been drained percutaneously for three to four months, but it was just full of necrotic spleen and it wouldn't come out of the 10 French or 14 French percutaneous drain. We drained it from the stomach and patient, you know, immediately started to feel better. So our surgeons are also very interested in this uh, in these procedures that we are offering right now. We can also do uh, you know manometry uh, with endoflip during endoscopy. Manometry is something that patients are not very comfortable doing uh, because you place a catheter through their nose. But now we can do the same, almost the same type of manometry while they are sleeping. Um, I'm just gonna you know show you some check marks. Uh, I I have started here at Rutgers uh, in September. Uh, so, over the past four months, with the help of you know, our leadership, uh, getting all the devices that we needed, with the help of our anesthesiology team at MSP, and also an excellent team at MSP, we have been able to do many of these procedures. We have done liver biopsies. We are doing them routinely. We are doing EUS-guided portal pressure measurement routinely. We have done EUS-guided coil and glue embolization of varices. For myotomies, we have done POEM. We have done G-POEM. Uh, for resections, we are doing EMR, we have done ESD, we have done full thickness resection. Uh, for those EUS guided drainage and anastomosis that I show you, we have done abscess drainage, gastroenterostomies, enterostomies, necrostectomy for management of uh, pancreatitis. For biliary treatments, the hepaticogastrostomy, you know, cholidocodudenostomy, that edge procedure that I showed you a variation of that. We have done all of that at UH over the past four months uh, with excellent outcomes. For our endobariatrics, we have a good weight management center uh, with our surgeon, endocrinologist, nutritionist. We are getting referrals for patients. Uh, we have patients that are waiting for their balloon placement and endoscopic sleep gas request at this moment. We are just um, you know, doing negotiations with their insurance to see if we can uh, get coverage for them and do those procedures as well. Uh, and then finally, to finish, this is a picture of our excellent team. Obviously, this is a team sport. It's not a one-man show. Uh, you know, uh, anesthesiology has been very gracious. They have been very flexible to start doing these new procedures, sometimes more complicated and risky at MSP. We have done all of these things at our in our own endoscopy suite without needing to go to the OR. Uh, our nurses and techs have done an excellent job. Uh, these are pictures that we take after we do uh, any procedure for the first time at uh, Rutgers University Hospital. 
and you can see our fellow and our advanced fellow, uh, and they have been uh, doing very well. This is my contact information. If you have any questions about any of these procedures or any patient that you want to talk to us, uh, you can contact me directly, or you can always reach out to our consult service, and we are more than happy to help you. Okay, that would be all. Dr. Adif Al-Tel, you know, thanks so much for this uh, really terrific uh, overview and uh, of uh, all these um, uh, new novel uh, approaches to management, a whole slew of um, GI and GI-related types of uh, medical uh, problems. So um, we have some time, so that's going to be great. And I want to encourage people to either, uh, guess you can raise your hand uh, or use the chat or just speak up, would be fine as well. Um, while waiting for that, let me just, uh, there's a lot of things, a lot of areas you cover, a lot of topics. Um, uh, in the use of, for example, the stents, you know, uh, particularly in use for drainage, let's say, of, uh, of pancreatic abscess, as you noted, or other types of uh, drainage procedures, uh, what happens with the stent after the procedure is done? So we can, keep, usually we keep the metal stent in there for two to four weeks. Uh, usually after that, we can exchange it out for, you know, plastic stents if needed. Most of the time, the, the problem is solved and we can take the stent out. Uh, the holes usually close on their own. And if they do not close on their own, we can close them ourselves. Um, but sometimes we can keep the stents in there, sometimes indefinitely, uh, you know, uh, to, to have continue continued drainage. For example, a patient who has had a surgery for a benign problem, and now after the surgery, they have a, you know, a complication and they have you know, obstruction of their gut, hepatic jejunostomy and stenosis. We can place a stent, drain them directly from the liver into the, into the stomach. It's a, it's a patient that we have already done at Rutgers University. And then that type of a stent can be left there for years to drain the liver into the stomach without need for any surgery. So you have both options. If you don't need it anymore, you can take it out. If you still need it, you can leave it in place. That's great, thank you. Um, and again, please feel free. I think we're able to see the chat box here. Anybody has any questions? Um, you know, one of the very interesting things um, uh, that she noted at the very beginning of the talk in terms of the of the work for bariatrics is the impact on uh, uh, not LD, um, you know, alcoholic fatty liver disease. And uh, um, given the fact that the uh, indications for liver transplant is is uh, the largest now in the NASH population, um, uh, how do you how do you work that into the uh, timing for those folks with advanced liver disease from um, uh, NASH, and, and at what point uh, um, is it maybe reversible or irreversible? How does that figure into that overall very large and continuing to grow problem um, uh, in the uh, in the obese population? Yeah, so you know the the question of reversibility it's it's a very detailed question, probably best answered by my you know hepatologist colleagues, but overall almost. At, at all stages of liver disease due to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, if you have weight loss, you're going to do better. Even if you already have cirrhosis, you, you can have improvement of your fibrosis if you lose weight. Uh, if patients get to the point that they are decompensated uh, with uh, you know, severe clinically significant portal hypertension, it is generally not a good idea do an endoscopic bariatric procedure for them. It is also not a good idea to do a surgical bariatric procedure for them, and they usually should go to um, uh, liver transplantation. But there are a lot of patients around uh, with a little bit of fibrosis and no cirrhosis, uh, for example, F2 or F3 fibrosis. They will benefit you know, significantly from doing an endobariatric procedure. And there are a lot of patients around that have compensated cirrhosis with low MELD scores. And those patients are not gonna get to transplant anytime soon. They are not gonna get a transplant for years. And those patients are compensated. They do not have clinically significant portal hypertension. And those patients are also excellent candidates for doing endobariatric procedures. And they are gonna benefit mass massively from that. Uh, as I said, the main barrier right now is insurance coverage. If patients had the, uh, you know, had the 
cash to pay for these procedures as they do in some of the centers around us in the in the city uh, you know they can benefit from it unfortunately around our hospital most of our patients do not have that uh, flexibility with their finances so you know we have just started offering these and we are talking with the insurance trying to find a way to cover these uh, procedures for our patients but with uh, clinical trial data coming out, I'm very hopeful that over the next year or two, we are going to get uh, much better coverage from the insurances. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, from uh, Dr. Raghavanshi asked you know, a very interesting question about the issue about the gastroparesis, the success rates um, uh, in treatment for gastroparesis in diabetic versus non-diabetics. Yes. So uh, the the studies on uh, G point for gastroparesis, we have studied all comers. We have also studied, uh, you know, diabetic and non-diabetic, and the non-diabetic and idiopathic, let's call it, and diabetic gastroparesis, they kind of um, respond the same if they have the same symptoms. Meaning that if they have mainly the symptoms of retention and uh, nausea and vomiting and fullness. If patients have the symptoms of epigastric pain and dyspepsia, as is the experience with, uh, you know, surgical management, they do not have a good response. Uh, the main thing is that gastroparesis is a multifactorial uh, disease. Uh, the spasm of the pylorus is significant in some patients, and those patients uh, respond very well to G poem or pyloroplasty or pylorotomy. But in some patients, the main pathophysiology is paralysis and the slowness of the peristalsis in the fundus of the stomach and in the distal body and antrum of the stomach. Uh, the hope was that those patients are going to respond well to the pacemakers. Unfortunately, the pacemaker data is you know, very mixed. Um, so overall, in all comers, as well as in idiopathic and diabetes, uh, you can expect in in real world there are like anecdotal a small series that you know report eighty percent eighty five percent improvement after G poem. I do not believe that. I think in, in real life, for all comers, you can have very good response in about sixty percent of your patients if you perform G poem for them. Thank you. Yeah, great. Uh, can you differentiate? Presumably, you can differentiate ahead of time whether the problem is a primary gas or yes, gastric gastric problem. Yeah. We actually can. So uh, let me show you that slide. I showed you that manometry that you can right. do under uh, under anesthesia, that endoflip. We have the endoflip endoflip device available at Rutgers University Hospital now. And while patients are sleeping, we can place that balloon across their pylorus and see if the pylorus is spastic or not for case selection. Great. Maybe the final thank you. Maybe the final question. Uh, Dr. Alawat is asking about. You know, the status of advanced um, endoscopic training uh, in the United States, uh, are there, is there some advances going on in, in the credentialing and standardizing the, um, uh, the training uh, for advanced endoscopists? Well, Dr. Hallowell has uh, much more experience uh, than me in this regard, uh, but I, I think uh, it's, a, it's a very important uh, point. Uh, you know, there was a time that just uh, spending some time with ERCP and Diagnostic EUS during your third year of uh, GI uh, fellowship would have been enough for you to do it a little bit after you graduate. Um, after that, we realized that you at least need a, a year of focus training. And now a few uh, programs in the in the country, they have moved towards two year training, although most uh, half of that two year training is usually used for research and another half is used for uh, clinical training. So most of the programs right now perform a one year of clinical training. And depending on what type of training you have had during your general GI and what type of quality of training you have during your advanced endoscopy training, it might be enough or might not be enough for you. As you saw, you know, there is a there is a very large list of procedures that you need to perform and get uh, get comfortable with. Uh, so far, as far as I know, uh, the American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, ACE, um, has not really moved towards, you know, having their own 
uh, you know, bored, uh, so to speak, just like what happened with obesity. Um, but it's something that you can imagine happening in near future, just because of the uh, of the sheer uh, volume of the advances that has uh, have been made in the, in the field. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ali Fasalian. Um, uh, our time, our, our time is our time is up this morning. Uh, I want to thank you for a wonderful talk, a wonderful overview. Thank you for bringing all of these things here to uh, the medical school. I'm sorry we have some interference right now, but uh, I want to thank everybody for joining this morning and uh, wish you all a great rest of the day. Thanks so much. You are.